Uh, first, I just want to thank Barbara and Barbara Wall and Mission and Ministry, who um, Barbara didn't mention, but uh, they were responsible in part for funding my time in Leuven, and so uh, I'm very grateful for that. And the Augustine Historical Institute as well provide, here at Villanova provided some funds for our time in Belgium, and um, this, this project and this paper wouldn't have been possible without that, so thank you again. Um, my dis my dis I'm going to summarize some of the work that I did uh, on my dissertation, which resulted uh, out of that time in Leuven. But this is also um, a kind of more focused talk than, uh, than I've given before. And I, uh, when I offered in the spirit of um, trying to think along with Augustine, rather than about Augustine. And to that end, uh, I would very much welcome your questions and comments and thoughts uh, at the end especially uh, from the students that are here. Okay, by way of introduction, I, I want to approach desire and delight in Augustine's thought by means of what may seem at first to be a rather circuitous route. Consider this question, which in various forms was dear to Augustine. What is it that makes us free? Our spontaneous answer is to identify our freedom with the self-determination that choice enables. Now consider the workaday notion of choice. Isn't my ability to choose between various alternatives a decisive component in what makes me free? We tend, after all, to think of choice as guaranteeing freedom precisely to the extent that it is a self-directed motion, that is a, a movement that is caused not by something outside of myself, but rather by whatever faculty of initiative that I myself possess. And when we privilege choice this way, we assume that uh, what we have is the ability to determine ourselves and that this is essential for our freedom, perhaps even the whole of what makes us free. And conversely, when we emphasize self-determination, freedom becomes identical with our power to choose. Now, this description of freedom as choice accounts for my basic intuition, our basic intuition. I think that I am responsible for, the act for my actions just insofar as I, and I alone, cause them by my power and my initiative. Responsible agency seems to depend on the power of choice to the point that freedom and self-determination underwrites our moral and legal codes and relationships. But notice that such an account of freedom has very little to say about what actually motivates us to choose. If I insist that responsible agency is ultimately reducible to free choice, where free means the lack of anything determining me that's not within my control, then it becomes a puzzle how or why I would choose anything at all, rather than some other thing. Paradoxically, when we reduce freedom to choice, which would seem to ground responsibility, it begins to look suspiciously like forfeiting responsibility. For if nothing determines my choice except a spontaneous act of the will, then how is such a choice different in practice from the unmotivated and purely random happenings of chance? Furthermore, resolving the mystery of freedom by identifying it with self-determination seems only to obscure rather than illuminate other foundational human experiences. And to name the foremost example, and one that takes us to the heart of what I want to talk about today, um, how are we to interpret the phenomenon of delight, in which our spontaneous response to beauty takes the form of a profound and intimate attraction? If what is freely mine is only what I determine by and for myself, then the experience of responsive and ecstatic, outstanding outside of the self, wonder before beauty, an experience that's constituted precisely by and through the passage between myself and what is other, what precedes and astonishes myself, could never arise. Like others before me, I initially turned to Augustine, who Hannah Arendt called the first philosopher of the will, to help me think through these perplexities about freedom. And what I found, at least initially, was not clarity, but rather further perplexity. This, Augustine likes to do this, just when you hope that he gives you some clarity, he gives you further perplexity instead. And here's the compounded perplexity. On the one hand, Augustine seems to affirm a notion of freedom as identical with radical self-determination. We can see this, for example, in his definition of voluntas. This is the first definition on the handout, or will, which 
in an early text, he describes, defines as a movement of the soul with nothing forcing it either not to lose something or to acquire something. In this succinct statement, Augustine affirms two characteristics of the will that he will never retract. First, that the will is a motion of the soul, and therefore it's uniquely mine, inasmuch as I am my soul. And second, that this particular soul motion is distinguished from other types of movement by a lack of coercive force. Taken in isolation, these two characteristics, personal identification with the action and the absence of any external coercion, would seem to support an identification of freedom with choice, self-determination. On the other hand, and here comes the perplexity, consider the most celebrated line in Augustine's corpus found in the opening address to his God in the Confessions. And this is quote one on the back of the page. It should be familiar, hopefully, to everyone in the room. You rouse us so that we delight in praising you, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Note the way in which Augustine's evocation, invocation of the heart, what Jim Wetzel calls the transgressive organ. Note how this departs from any simple description of freedom as self-determining. The restless heart is not the choosy will. As lovers know, what the heart wants is not an expansion of options, but rather a unity with the beloved. The rest that love desires is not the security of serene self-possession, self-determination, but rather the adventure of an encounter with a good that is radically other, a good that delights me just insofar as it beyond my every attempt to anticipate it or master it. Thus, the beginning of Augustine's Confessions reminds us that we are moved by a power that is ours, but that is nevertheless not voluntary in the sense of being simply or merely under our control. For when I love, it is certainly I who wills to love, but when I interrogate this experience of loving desire, love appears in the first place as something not that I initiate, but that I undergo or suffer. If we dwell with the phenomenon of love as Augustine himself does, if we give it a starring role in the story of our self unfolding as he does in the Confessions, then our soul's movement appears less like a choice between alternatives and more like a vector of desire drawn inexorably and intimately towards the good that delights us. If I insist, by contrast, on self-determination within a relationship of love, then I deform love itself. What I get instead is the relative safety of a contractual agreement. If what love desires is rest in the binding unity of, the, of self with what it loves, then the more I love, the less I am free. If, by what I mean by freedom, is the unrestricted possibility of choice. So the question of freedom, far from just resolving when we look at Augustine's account, especially um, across his thought, opens a new and more profound perplexity. What is the relationship between love and freedom? And my best attempt at answering that question is to show that Augustine's account of love as ecstatic desire is not at odds with our freedom, despite its initial appearance to the contrary. In fact, I aim to show that Augustine's attentiveness to loving desire opens a new understanding of what it means to be genuinely free. Here's my basic claim. What is philosophically significant about Augustine's account of love as desire and delight is that it reveals the poverty of a notion of freedom that imagines self-determination or, or choice as the way to secure my moral and personal integrity against loss and confusion. For love, on Augustine's telling, even love of finite temporal things enables a release of the self from the tyranny of self-enclosed willing, an opening to the world in which the good of the other is affirmed even as the presence of the self to the other in love enlarges and releases the self from more limited and self-insistent forms of willing. Now, Augustine inherited not only a stoic understanding of the self, this account of freedom as keeping oneself from what disperses the self, but also a platonic tradition in which the self is approached through eros, as desire, the loving desire that the philosopher Joseph Pieper has memorably described as the basic form of man's being beside himself. Whereas the stoic self seeks to minimize exchange between the world and the self, determined to preserve self-integrity through reduction of any kind of extrinsic 
motivations or in impositions, the erotic self throws open the passages between self and other, allowing the porosity, the openness of desire to make way for an inflow of goods beyond our control. There's a paradoxical character to erotic love, as I never uh, cease to tell my students. They're very familiar with my reading of the symposium on this score. It's not simply striving or self-love born out of lack. It's also a responsiveness to the fullness of good that exceeds the self. In the language of the confessions, desire grants a new life that is not grasped, but is endowed, is gifted. This is perhaps the most platonic of ideas, that loving desire is born not only out of lack, but also out of fullness. Erotic desire is not simply acquisitive grasping, but rather a seeking that's in intimate communication with the good that it desires. And in the Confessions, Augustine radicalizes this platonic desire into an anthropology of love, uh, account of the human person on the basis of love. And in doing so, he abandons an earlier, more stoically inflected ideal of wisdom as the integrity of possessing the oneself securely against the world. He reflects in the confessions upon the ways in which the happenings of desire reveal the human agent as creaturely and contingent, and so not free in the sense of determining either the source or the end of its willing. But for this very reason, desire intimates an ever-present communication with what exceeds ourself. There's a divine work already at work in all of our, um, a divine gift already at work in all of our willing, funding our choices. <clears throat> According to my reading, the revolutionary moment in Augustine's own philosophical development came when he saw that freedom of will and love are in fact identical. The crucial conceptual innovation that made this possible for Augustine was his insight that the movement of the soul that is the will, the voluntas, occurs primarily through the experience of delectatio, delight, which I have a, a note on on the front of the page. Because delight is a form of motion that is initiated beyond my self-determining control. The one thing that we can't do phenomenologically is surprise ourselves. We're always surprised despite ourselves. We can't, as it were, create surprise for ourselves. And so delight is a form of motion that is initiated beyond my self-control, my self-determining control. And it follows that the will moved by delight cannot become free through simple self-determining choice, but rather through loving a good that's not reducible to my own choice. Of course, this entails potentially opening oneself to, it entails definitely opening oneself to what might be a potential danger. There are, after all, struggles and difficulties that come along with opening oneself to loving things that one could lose. And if anything, these are intensified as Augustine comes to see in the Confessions, especially that the moral life is one that is dramatic and fraught with failures, loss, and grief. But Augustine's more mature account of personal integrity faces up to the honest difficulties of loving humanly, rather than hiding behind an perhaps inspiring, but ultimately illusory, ideal of integrity as self-determining security. For Augustine, then, the beginning of freedom is not self-possession or self-determination, but rather a humility that loves what is not mine to possess. And personal integrity on this account involves a freeing release of goods that are not in my control, that I cannot possess, and yet that I love as good. Thus, Augustine's account of desire and delight recontextualizes the very meaning of freedom itself. Love, properly understood, is rightly ordered desire for what exceeds the self, and delight in the good that is encountered in the other. Thus conceived, love provides the link between personal integrity as free responsibility on the one hand, it is, after all, I who loves, and release from an illusory sense of self-possession or self-determination on the other. Ecstatic love is being freed from the tyranny of self-determining enclosure. Because I love, I'm always already in a dynamic relationship with a good that exceeds the self. Because I love, my fundamental relationship to the world is always already an openness to what exceeds me, 
in terms of both limited goods and eternal goods. My loving desire is thus an openness to what is other than myself, and it's a gift from the same God who gave me my own gift of existence. Okay, so um, I now want to uh, look at a couple of texts. The first is uh, Augustine's De Libro Arbitrio, um, which is the locus classicus, the place where most, especially philosophers, are guilty of just going here to look and see what Augustine has to say about freedom or the will. And then, we're, and then I'm going to look at the confessions. So uh, you might want to turn to the page with the quotes because I'm going to reference some of those now. Throughout this early treatise on free choice, which is what De Libro Arbitrio uh, might be translated as, Augustine describes the will as I've been talking about in terms of self-determination. Uh, not only is the will a motion of the soul that remains free from external force, it also seems to be perfectly identical with the power to choose. And there's nothing at all standing between the moment of willing and the motion of the soul. As Augustine puts it, and this is the second quote, quote two, nothing is so much within our power as the will itself, for it is near at hand the very moment that we will. Now, in order to draw the will, and therefore our freedom in better relief, Augustine invites us to, to make a contrast between the familiar phenomenon of emotion that happens, not by our willing, but by nature. So he suggests we consider the downward uh, motion of a stone. This is the third quote. When the movement of a stone is caused by its own weight, rather than by any extrinsic force, such as when I were, would throw it up in the air, we can say that the movement comes, the movement is of the stone, Augustine says. It's the stone's motion and not mine by throwing it. And just as the will is a movement of the soul, so too is the weight of the stone a movement of the weight. That's Augustine's point. What makes it belong to the thing is that nothing extrinsic forces it. But there's a crucial difference, of course, between how the stone moves and how my soul moves. And uh, this is to continue the quote, while, quote, the movement of the will is similar to the downward movement of a stone in that it belongs to the will, just as the movement of the stone belongs to the stone, nevertheless, the stone has no power to check or halt or stop its downward movement. So this is what makes the will unique. It can direct its motion in some way. And this is precisely what we mean when we talk about resp being responsible for our motions. We don't blame the will for its fall, but we do blame the soul when it falls or lapses into um, sin. Weight functions in the De Libre Arbitrio, then, as an image of necessity. Its role is to illustrate a motion that's proper to the object moved, in this case the stone, but that is nevertheless not self-determining. It's, a, it's an account of uh, necessitation, with what Augustine says, movement by nature. Now, the will, on the other hand, is voluntary. It's moved by its own self-motion. So uh, I'm going to compress the rest of this lengthy uh, dialogue uh, in terms of the implications of what, of what uh, Augustine takes from this understanding of free choice. Early on, he makes the, this contrast. A bad will is one that allows itself to be moved extrinsically, as it were, by a desire for goods that lie outside of the power of the will itself. As it were, it forfeits its voluntary motion. These are goods like the opinions of others, the amassing of wealth, the enjoyment of physical pleasure, whereas a good will is one, quote, by which we desire to live upright and honorable lives and to attain the highest wisdom. And thus, a good will is one that desires virtue, where that virtue is just within the reach of the will itself, insofar as it wills it. Now, uh, Augustine is, has some insight here about the important and legitimate role for self-determination. He insists that it's only through our will of self-determining that we become responsible moral agents. And secondly, he contrasts freedom as self-determination with undisciplined de desire, untutored desire, desire which is not love in its fullest freedom, but rather a lack that is often manifest in the impoverished and acquisitive and grasping desire that Augustine calls libido or lust. So on my reading, the positive contribution of this text is that um, Augustine gives us what I would call a pedagogy, a teaching uh, uh, account of desire. What it means to be free is to recognize and take responsibility for what it is that I love. That's good. But Augustine gets himself in trouble when he depicts freedom as a matter of strategic 
preference for what will make me secure in myself so that I'm invulnerable to any loss or suffering. He wants to exclude the possibility that my happiness would lie in anything beyond myself, outside of my control. If we wish to be happy, he says, we should love our own goodwill, since it's immediately within our possession as soon as we love it, as soon as we will it. He describes it uh, in the following terms, and this is the fourth quote. Those who have this goodwill lovingly embrace this one unsurpassable good and delight in its presence. They enjoy it to the full, and they rejoice when they consider that so great a good is theirs and that it cannot be stolen or taken away from them against their will. This is uh, an important text. When Augustine says that happy souls lovingly embrace this one unsurpassable good, he tacitly identifies the will, self-determination, freedom as we often consider it, with the highest good, as that than which no other good is greater. When he goes on to claim that the goodwill's invulnerability to theft or loss causes the one possessing it to delight, to rejoice, and most tellingly to fully enjoy this one good that remains self-secure, he employs the language of a love that has found rest in that which will in that which will satisfy it. But these two attributes, unsurpassable goodness and the sight of the heart's resting enjoyment, are fundamentally the attributes of God, the God whom Augustine came to describe in the Confessions as more intimate to him than his inmost part and higher than what was highest in him. The tension between the good of the self-determining will and the good of a God who always exceeds the self remains unresolved in the De Libra Arbitrium. And by the end of the text, he becomes disillusioned with this possibility even of perfectly self-possessing uh, himself and self-determining himself by means of his will. On the one hand, there's the nagging suspicion made palpable through his experience with his own moral difficulty and also with his uh, need to take care of those who now are under his pastoral responsibility that the promise of perfected virtue, the overcoming of a divided self through discipline and contemplation, actually lies beyond what might be possible for us in this life, even if we're heroically virtuous. And on the other hand, and more to the point, there's a pressing question about whether we should even desire this kind of freedom in the first place. Assuming that we could achieve a life that was characterized by perfect inner tranquility, undisturbed by what lies outside our will, our self-determining control, and therefore outside of ourselves, is this even a life that we should want? If we're to make sense of love, and if it's to become constitutive for a philosophical and theological account of the human person, then we will need to abandon this false ideal of wisdom as self-determination. Okay, so at last, uh, to the confessions, the last section. If we dwell with the phenomenon of love, as Augustine himself does, our soul's movement begins to appear less like uh, a choice between alternatives and more, as I've said already, like a vector drawing us towards a good that delights us. And in a startling reversal, the motion of the soul appears in the confessions not as self-determining resistance, like halting our fall downwards, but like weight itself. Right? What was a necessity in the De Libra Arbitrio now becomes the very heart of what Augustine is talking about in the Confessions. He says, by love we are moved towards what, is, what delights us, much as by weight the stone is drawn towards its natural place. So he's completely reversed what he was saying uh, in the De Libra Arbitrio. What does he mean by this? In the final book of the Confessions, book 13, Augustine clarifies what he means. The central feature of weight there seems to be its intentionality, its direction towards its end, its purposive movement towards a goal. What it means for a natural body to move by its weight is for it to move towards its proper place. This is a uh, quote five. I'm just going to quote a, a few things from it. So when the stone goes uh, to downwards, it moves by its weight. But it, when the fire moves upwards, we could just as well say that it moves by its weight. That is, weight just indicates when a thing moves in the direction that it does by its nature. Weight is, in other words, the movement by which everything strives to find its place. And indeed, 
the very striving itself, Augustine identifies with weight. Therefore, weight, in this sense, becomes a master metaphor in the physical world for the dynamism of a body in the process of seeking out order and balance and equilibrium, finding its rest. It's what pulls everything towards its proper place. So long as things are still in the process of striving towards their respective goals, the stone in its free fall, the flame trying to get up to heaven, they can be said to be restless. But as each thing finds its ordained place, it ceases its striving, it achieves its goal, it finds its rest. Things not yet having found their place are restless, as he says there at the end of quote five, finding their place, they are at rest. Now Augustine's foundation in the Confessions, announced in the very opening line, is that human beings are essentially and inescapably lovers, moved by delight in our encounter with the good. And insofar as we're still striving for that good, we're restless. But when we ascend in praise, confessing both our iniquity, our sin, and the goodness of our created contingency, we, we strive to find our place and our rest in the transcendent source of our being. So in the confessions, uh, the motion of the soul is a love, and that love is our weight. My love is my weight, writes Augustine. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. So I want to conclude by offering a reflection upon this uh, shift in Augustine's thinking. And I want to focus on book eight, the famous book of Augustine's conversion in the garden. And I want to offer a reading that seeks to draw out some of the implica implications that identifying the love, uh, amor, with the will, voluntas, has for Augustine's understanding of freedom. Augustine speaks in this book of a, a kind of freedom that's not like choosing for himself, but that's more like being freed. The language he uses is having his chains broken. Um, he talks about being liberated from the desire for things that restrict and dissipate his soul. And he describes this experience of being disintegrated, uh, dissipated, as being unable to will what is good, despite a clear understanding even, even maybe assenting to, a notional assent saying yes to, what it is that we know is good, and yet being unable to will it. And this admission, this interrogation of the will's inability to do what it is that would be good for it, marks a, a counterpoint to Augustine's earlier claim in this text, the De Libre Arbitrio, that the will is in its own power just insofar as it wills itself. Augustine describes his wrestling with himself as the inability of the will to obey itself perfectly. Here there's an explicit recognition that it's not within the power of the will to simply will what it wills, or even what it wants to will. He says, I was not doing what I yearned to do and could have done the moment I so resolved. The reason I would submit that Augustine relates these struggles with the will is so that he can disabuse himself and us of the idea that wisdom involves the kind of self-determination or choice that opposes the will to the appetites, the will to our desire, as if the will were a distinct faculty that could just choose between various options. Instead, by identifying the will with love, amor, Augustine recognizes the need for an, an intensification and stabilization or purification of the love of the love that we possess as our will. When he's being precise, Augustine describes the soul that's torn apart, that doesn't have this single, uh, this heart that wills one thing as follows, and this is the quote number six. The self which willed to serve God was identical with the self which was unwilling. It was I. I was neither wholly willing nor wholly unwilling, so I was in conflict with myself and was dissociated from myself. The dissociation came about against my will, and yet it was not a manifestation of the nature of an alien mind, but the punishment that I suffered in my own mind. It was myself who uh, willed against my will. The self-same soul is not wholehearted in its desire for one or the other, and so it's torn apart. And what Augustine is describing here is a being bound by the will, but not because of like the tenacity of its choice, 
but rather because it lacks the gathered integrity of a single-hearted love. It's too dispersed between things that it doesn't love in a pure, in a pure way. So purity of love is what Augustine is suggesting as the very essence of freedom. And at the same time, this freedom can only be uh, given to Augustine by God. There's a sense in which the moment of Augustine's conversion in the garden is essentially a patience, a suffering, an undergoing. It entails a purification of his love by God, but not in a way that's extrinsic to Augustine or that would replace his will with an alien will so that he chooses this instead of that. Rather, what, what happens in the Confessions in Book 8 is that something simultaneously happens through his own effort to respond to the good that draws him and arouses him to a new desire. The love that is stirred in Augustine's heart is, it comes after the beauty that he has seen, the beauty that God gives in a gift, the beauty that elsewhere God will call, uh, Augustine will call grace. Precisely as an integrating love that overcomes the dissipated self, it requires, on Augustine's part, the spontaneous, wholehearted willing of himself, who encounters that good that takes him outside of himself. So he both wills it and he's drawn out in that willing. One of the most important moments in Augustine's conversion, and it's one that's often overlooked, and I promise I'm coming to the end here, um, is his vision of continent, continentia, lady continents, that comes to him as he's struggling in the garden. This is a uh, quote seven, the final quote on the, on the page. I think I left off the um, passage, but it's from book eight, 11, 27 of the Confessions. We can read Augustine's vision of continent as he's struggling in the garden as a trope for the beauty of a virtuous life that's not um, that, that lacks the, tri the tribulation and the trepidation and the dispersion of lust. And this is often how it's read. But I think we would miss two profound points if we left the matter there. The first is that continence, the lady continence, is modeled, I would suggest, on the woman whom Augustine loved, the one who was the mother of his son, Adeodatus, and who promised him a fidelity in spite of his abandonment of her. And in this way, perhaps, we might interpret the vision of Lady Continent there as Augustine's dawning recognition of the possibility of faithful love, even in this turbulent life of the flesh. So it's a personal revelation in that sense. The other point to observe is that in the vision, Continent is surrounded by children. And here we come to the quote, quote, a multitude of boys and girls were there, a great concourse of youth. And in all of them I saw this same continent was by no means sterile, but the fruitful mother of children who conceived in joy from you, her bridegroom. This is a astonishing uh, uh, claim that Augustine's making. He's giving us the picture of chastity that's fertile, that's fruitful, right? Continent that is generative, that has children, that gives new life. It's a profound reminder to us as well as to Augustine that the meaning of his desiring flesh is generativity, the creation of new life. And we might, we might make the provocative suggestion that Augustine could not come to his conversion as he does at the end of book eight until the weakness of his flesh were cared for, until in the most profound, profound sense his sexual need was gratified by God. And what form? would this gratification take? Perhaps the gift of children that Augustine would soon receive, not through physical reproduction, but through the continent that was required for his priesthood and then his episcopate, being a bishop, which put so many under his pastoral care and responsibility. So if I'm right then, book eight is about recognizing the intrinsic fecundity or generativity or new life that comes from desire from ecstatic desire. We might say that the nature of erotic love, of love as Augustine's talking about it in the Confessions, is to open itself beyond the exchange of one and the other and into the gift of a third. In the example of biological eros, desire, into the birth of a child. And this recalls again the Platonic account of love in which wanting to possess the good forever, as 
Plato puts it in the Symposium, appears paradoxically not like a striving to secure something just for myself, but rather a kind of disposition of myself, dispossession of myself, in an act that Plato memorably describes as giving birth in the presence of the beautiful. And to be sure, just as for Plato, sexual desire is a limited physical manifestation of the much broader phenomenon of erotic desire, so too sexual procreation is an analog for the self-surpassing generation that occurs when love is allowed its fullest expression. Thus, I would argue that the figure of continence and her link to generativity are crucial for how Augustine comes to understand freedom and being freed in book eight and therefore in the whole of the Confessions. The linking of continence as a gathering, integrity, a self-possession, as well as a self-dispossession, a gift of, of new life, is a reminder to Augustine that flesh is inscribed with a meaning that he cannot simply discard or oppose to a higher form of love. This is, uh, I, I would say, what Augustine realizes in the incarnation of his God, that God takes the form of a flesh that cannot be discarded, and that that flesh comes in the form of a child, one who is the result of um, life-giving desire. Therefore, the injunction that he should, quote, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for the flesh in its lusts, the text that he reads, that he opens when he hears the tole lege in the garden, it's not an injunction to avoid or disparage desire, but rather to allow the very meaning of his flesh, the true meaning of his flesh, in its contingency and its porosity, its openness, to be a mediator of what is good and other to himself. In conclusion, we've seen then that in his confessions, Augustine came to abandon his earlier ideal of um, uh, wisdom as narrow self-possession. And he began and said to explore the ways in which a dispossessed self is one that paradoxically is more truly free. The crucial insight for Augustine here is that loving desire that is, love as desire, is not a threat to freedom, but rather an opening to a being freed beyond the self. And in his rehabilitation of affect and desire that, he, um, that occurs when he begins to identify the will with love, he offers us a new imagination for a kind of personal integrity and a freedom that goes beyond self-determination. To love goods beyond our own self-determination releases them and us from the exclusive tyranny of self-enclosed control, choice, and willing, and frees us into the shared space in which the good of the other is affirmed. What Augustine teaches us then in the Confessions is that we find our freedom only by allowing the beauty that is beyond us to draw us through love. We become most free when we allow the weight of our love to determine us, to pull us beyond our limited conception of ourself and into the community of being as good. Thank you very much.
um, this ability or in this sort of uh, this need to encounter um, the world because um, if love can't do it by itself, in other words, we can't force an encounter with beauty, we can both go see the same Shakespearean play and come away with two very different reactions and that um, you know, beauty could have been there and yet uh, you saw and I didn't and mm -hmm. we both came in with different intentions to see something. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe faith has something to disclose that love simply can't do without. Right. Um, and in that connection, you know, it's striking to me that Augustine in book one of the Liber of Atrio does lay out uh, God as a number of definitions attached to him as the object of faith and it is a faith seeking understanding. So mm -hmm. I mean, that, that may change the way we read some of what he's doing later on in the book. But just, uh, just how you would place you know, the faith that works through love, uh, how you can integrate faith into this account you've given us of right. the light and openness in time. Right. The first thing I would say is um, I, it's actually, while it's the case that we can't surprise ourselves, it's not the case that we can't become better lovers, which is to say, one of the things that Augustine um, gives us, and this I think he's already working towards in the Daily Rabbitio, but certainly it's in the Confessions, is that if we are attentive to the beauty that we, that's around us already, it become, it elicits us, right? So it works in both ways. We, um, we have to pay attention. In some ways, training our love is just an act of paying attention. So I'm very much like Simone Bay and others who've taken up love. Again, Iris Murdoch comes to mind um, uh, as well in the 20th century. And so it's not, what we can't do is give our, create an object of beauty for ourselves, right? Now, um, you're absolutely right to bring in faith. And of course, um, Augustine, uh, what is the object that moves us preeminently and ultimately? Nothing but God himself, who we know through faith. This is the, the, the second thing that he follows up with. On the, our heart is restless, but how will we know God unless he's been preached to us, right? So um, certainly faith is what gives us the object uh, of, our, of our love, right? But it's also the case that um, I think in the daily barbiture, just to follow up, um, on your final point there, that Augustine, in trying to understand what it is that he believes, he comes too close to identifying the good with making one's will be what it is that God wills. And that actually undoes, in a certain sense, what it means to be a creature. And so, in fact, it does away with also the need for faith in a certain way, because if the will can, certain, can sort of will it directly, then uh, what need is there, in fact, for uh, faith? So it's reaffirming his creatureliness, precisely in the confessions that brings faith really back to the, to the, to the fore, I'm saying. Okay. Well, thank you for a really uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, am I right to think that, um, I, you know, just thinking again about the, the, the confessions 13, 9, um, is the mistake that we make in with um, in the way we tend to think about freedom is that we we think that freedom means weightlessness, right. and yep. and so you know the the one problematic view would be trying to be weightless. Another problem would be if you have weight but are descending. Right. And what you're describing is that real freedom is. An ascending weightiness. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, Augustine's really cool. I keep trying to tell my students that. Um, right. No, that's, that's absolutely right. And I think that um, it's hard to pin it down. Augustine is always a mind on the move. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, in his early text, he's really trying to understand this thing uh, that, that where I choose, uh, and I think he ha he's, it, 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 it sort of just infiltrated the culture, this, this stoic, uh, at least the more, the more literate uh, culture, that the stoic ideal of wisdom, which is a weightlessness or a buffered self, what, ta what, what um, Charles Taylor calls a buffered self, would be the, the best that one can do in this life with respect to happiness. And Augustine is thinking his way and is moving his way and is being 
loved out of that um, ideal of wisdom. And so the negative way of putting it, right, the, the kind of pessimistic Augustine that we hear too much about, in my opinion, would say, we can't be happy in this life. But the positive one is to say, what is it, is to ask the question, what are you imagining your, a happy life would look like? It would look like what, what we're learning from, what we've learned from Seneca and Cicero and Epictetus, where we, we, we don't weep when we lose when our mother dies, because we learn not to attach ourselves to those things, that, that's an inhuman way of loving, right? And the, the really amazing thing, I think, that happened in book eight, and I, I'm more and more convinced of this, is that his experience of being a father himself and loving a child who is beyond, as, as those of us who are parents know, uh, are beyond our control, <laughs> and yet are good and, and delightful, and we don't always appreciate that, that good, right? Um, that is linked to his, the dawning realization of what the incarnation means, that this is the form in which uh, God reveals himself, uh, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, an astonishing thing. So, so then love, in this sense, sense is ecstatic, is dangerous as well as the only way in which we do ascend. It's, a, it's an illusion to think we're weightless. Quinn. Um, Dr. Camacho, so thank you for the speech this wonderful. Um, so as uh, as this divine engineer is the expert, um, free choice or can I say it's free will? Um sure. Yeah. Um, He's tricky, but yes. free will is the external externally inhibited uh, power to choose which we have as moral agent and then the freedom the final freedom is the fullest sense. In its fullest sense, it's perfection of will that it will support the native self in truth and will of God. So with those two in mind, do you think the free will as God given to us is a gift or a test? This is, that's an excellent question. And it's a question that Augustine's friend, Evodius, uh, who is the dialogue partner in the De Libra Arbitrio, asks him, and Augustine says, because we can choose what is good with this power that's given to us, it's got to be good. But Evodius wants to know, well, then why do we ever choose what's bad? Right? We've had, you and I have had discussions about this very thing. Um, Augustine, as long as Augustine is thinking about uh, choosing what's good or bad only in terms of the arbitrary choice between one or the other, he can't answer that question. Because there'd be nothing that would motivate us to choose what would be bad for ourselves. But as soon as, as soon as um, uh, uh, the, uh, that is, if it's just a free choice without anything motivating me, right? There's, there's nothing really pulling me one way or the other to make that initial choice for what's bad. There's no explanation for it. It's like, uh, it's just this dark mystery. And in fact, he, he struggles, he tries to find ways. He, his, his, his move at the end of this book is to say, um, well, we are now, we're now suffering, and he holds on to this idea uh, as a result of Adam's choice in, in the Garden of, of Eden, yeah? who chose this initially, and now we all are born in this condition where we can't help but make this choice. Our free will is defective in some way. Something's gone wrong. But then Avodius says, well, why did Adam choose that? And Augustine says, maybe it's like he was somewhere between being awake and being asleep, where he, he didn't quite know that it was bad, but he chose it anyway. Um, he doesn't really give a very convincing answer. It's an act of pride, an act out of pride of defying, uh, defying authority. Yeah. Um, and then it's a free All Eve said is, don't eat the, God said, don't eat the fruit, mm -hmm. you shall die. The mm -hmm. serpent could have stopped there, but the serpent go on to say, you will be like God. Mm -hmm. And God said not to do it. It's, right. So eating is not only you be like God, but there's also the act of defining authority. Is that called? Yeah. Is that choosing of that badness, like the act of stealing the pear tree? Is this an act of defining? Absolutely. And Augustine, um, in fact, explicitly says, it's not that the thing that we choose is itself bad, right? 
Nothing that is in the created order is bad. The problem is that uh, we want to possess for ourselves. Early on, he's going to say we, we, we choose something that's going to make us kind of miserable if, we, if, if, it, uh, falls, if it decays or if it dies, like his friend in book four, right? But then uh, as time goes on, as he thinks more about love, he thinks actually the problem is when we insist upon self-determination as the heart of our will, what we do is make ourselves be the ones who give for ourselves our own power. And he actually thinks that um, this is fundamentally that act of pride, superbia, rather than um, loving the, the God who created us, which is an act of humility, but also is the way in which we become, which we gain our freedom here, right? So for Augustine, freedom in its fullest sense means uh, not being able to choose what would be bad for us. It's a restriction on our choices, right? Whereas precisely sin looks like trying to claim for myself whatever it is that I want, regardless of whether it's good for me. Great question, Quinn. Thanks. Yeah, Jane. Um, can you tell us why you think perhaps the figure of Lady Providence is based on Augustine's Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I, a part of it has been talking a lot with Jim Wetzel, so um, Jim, Jim has convinced me of this. Um, I, I, he might be the first to say it. Um, here's why, though, Jane. Um, uh, when Augustine dismisses his, his, his wife, uh, the, the most striking thing is he adds that Okay, he, he gives it from his own perspective. He's torn from the side, his heart is left wounded and bleeding. But then he adds this line, and she went away, and she didn't take another man. And he says, and I immediately found another woman, right? And, and he says, but the wound still festered, which is our first sign that what's going on there isn't about lust, right? If it was just about lust, getting another woman, as he would put it, right, would um, address that problem, right? So... Um, in hindsight, as he writes about this, it's so raw, of course, and it's clear that he is recognizing here that what he's doing is a betrayal of a woman who loves him better than he loves her. So the, and the way in which she does that is a way that he cannot yet do. Now, um, what Jim reminds me of is that um, not only did his wife leave and not only did she not take another um, uh, husband, she 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 was chaste then, so this is, but also that she left a Deodatus, probably about the age of thirteen, with Augustine, and signaling perhaps to Augustine that he's able to love better than he thinks he is, and that the presence of his son, as the fruit of their, their for by Augustine's own telling, their mutual and exclusive devoted love. Um, uh, the presence of a, of a Deodatus is a reminder to Augustine of the good that comes from that kind of devoted uh, love. And so here we, here we are in book eight where Augustine's saying it's all about my sexual habit, but this woman shows up, not just, not just chastity, but chastity that's also fertile and, re, and, re, and the next thing is don't care for your flesh. Well, he's, he's just been talking in, in book seven about the lack of flesh in the, in the plainness in their reading of, of the... Of, um, uh, uh, the word. So it's just hints here and there, right? I guess it only gives this little tantalizing thing. I know that last month when Catherine Conbert came over here and gave her lecture, she said that she thinks that Augustine's wife lived somewhere nearby mm. him and around right. her. Uh. To me, that was astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. Which would only perhaps would uh, intensify this, right? Yeah. Um, do you think that Augustine thinks it's necessary to suffer this self-disintegration, self-disassociation, dissociation, mm -hmm. before one can fall upward? <laughs> <laughs> right. The way you're suggesting. Um, I mean, that seems to have very radical implications for the whole idea of moral education. Yeah. Um, and right. So I mean, um, and you know, I do think of a, a certain sort of typical reading of the Confessions. Try out all these things, right, right, you know, right. before he sort of got right, which doesn't really seem to accord with what you're saying. Um, yeah. So, 
what extent is the, the experience here that support um, sort of the necessary uh, human experience mm -hmm. one must like said, suffer, undergo mm -hmm. um, at, one yep. own, at, at one's own hands right. um, before one can be whole or mm -hmm. possess oneself whole. Sure. Uh, in Book 7, Augustine reads the books of the Plainness, as you know well, and he's admonished to turn within himself, right? The Platonic, the, the trope of the Platonic sage at the time is when you turn inside, you discover a kind of inner citadel, right? That the more you turn inside, the more you perfect yourself or find that you are always in perfect touch with the one. Augustine turns inside and he discovers he's a mess, right? And I think he's suggesting that, suggesting that we might not all be as messy as Augustine is, but when we turn and look within ourselves, really, for the first time, honestly, we discover maybe we don't have it together in the way that we thought we did. And the choices that we're making that we think are come out of a kind of freedom are not really, they're actually, they're, what it means to be a human being um, after, in a, in, a fallen, in a fallen world is to be disintegrated in some way. Now, what Augustine has to suffer is not, um, by the way, I use suffer in the, in the kind of classical sense, like uh, it, it, uh, undergo as a kind of pathos, right? Is the recognition that there is something prior to as well as above himself. He also discovers when he turns in that God was always already there, right? And that's a recognition of beauty both within and without. As, as creator as, as well as at the heart of who he is, even despite himself, always at work already giving that offer of grace. So in that sense, in that sense alone, yeah, it's this, in, in that sense, this is the pattern for all conversion, right? What I'm suggesting is that the pattern of conversion is a recognition that um, it's not through my own self-determination that I will achieve wisdom. That's something you have to undergo, I think.